Testaments to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we'll be studying from there for a few moments this morning. It can be easy for us as we live our lives to lose focus on what is truly important, what is truly a part of our very being and substance. I think that's because we are spiritual creatures that are living in a physical universe. Um, there's a, a false understanding of Scripture um, that many have, I think, in the world today where we exist as little babies in heaven and then God sends us into a body. That's not what we read about in the Bible at all. The very first existence that we have is conception. And I don't know how that works, but God creates us, spiritual creatures, immediately within a physical universe. And we find ourselves in our greatest spiritual existence in a spiritual world and the promise of heaven. And that's what we're living for today. But that can be difficult because all I know and all you know is this physical universe. And what we're trying to learn more about and be more acquainted with and ready ourselves for are the spiritual reality. Certainly, spiritual things, spiritual beings exist now. We are those beings. And we fight against principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And, and Jesus is ministering to us daily. He is a spirit in heaven, as well as God and the Holy Spirit, as the word is revealed in and everything else they do as well. So we have a sense of spiritual reality from the revelation of God's will, but it's also a difficulty of applying those things and thinking in that way each and every day of our lives. And so I think what we find ourselves in a constant struggle with is misevaluating our everyday life and putting some physical matters on a greater level of importance than our spiritual matters, and we view our life as it consists in everything we see, everything we hear or smell or touch. In other words, everything we experience by our physical senses. Jesus addressed that kind of misunderstanding in Luke chapter 12. I want us to notice in Luke 12, beginning in verse 13, one from the crowd said to him, Jesus Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you, then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This man made the mistake of viewing his life as merely something composed of physical things. And the reality was there was a side of him that was eternal, and God required that of him toward the end of that parable. And he learned the lesson too late that my life is not about what I have, what I look like, how I feel. My life is not about the relationships that I sustain from day to day, from the least of them, like those of my co-workers, to the greatest of them, like those of my family. My life really isn't about that. My life, my very existence is spiritual. And it's wrapped up in God. That should be my focus. I want us to notice, firstly, the problem that Jesus addresses in Luke chapter 12 with this man First, he said in verse 15, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. That man who came to him with this demand, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me, maintained a false and vain perspective of life. And it had a cascading effect of problems 
as Jesus demonstrated in this very parable. I want us to notice what Jesus said. Life does not consist, or one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. In Scripture, there are two words for life in the Greek. There is zoe and bios. Bios is more familiar to us from biology and such. But the higher word in the Greek language and culture was bios because that word meant life and activity associated with it. And so we read of in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 that a good soldier is not uh, concerned with the affairs of this life, but he's wanting to please his master or his, his general, his, his captain. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, we read of the parable of the sower and the seed that is choked out by the thorny soil, and he speaks about the pleasures of life. That's bios. It also means resources needed to maintain that life. And so the things associated with life, what we're doing, what we're seeking, what we're enjoying, but also everything needed to maintain my life, like my livelihood is how it's translated in some places. Or in 1 John 3 and verse 17, when he speaks about how we should show love to our our brethren and give them the things that are needed. He speaks of this world's goods. Goods there is the Greek word bios, which is a word connoting life. And it may be said that one's bios consists in the things he possesses, contrary to what Jesus just said. And you notice in the latter part of Luke 12, he talks about worry. The text I think that we're most familiar with in this regard is the Sermon on the Mount is recorded by Matthew in chapter 6, but he, he talks about it here in Luke chapter 12, and he says in verse 30 that your father knows that you need these things. Your life does consist in these things. Not your zoe, but your bios, your, the, the things that maintain your physical life, like food and water and clothing. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He says one's zoe does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Vine says that word means life as a principle, life in the absolute sense. And so the verb form zao is translated live or living, and it's the concept of to live. The very fact that I am alive, that's what zoe is. It is the essence of my vitality, whether physical or, as we'll see, spiritual and so when we consider the very fact that I'm, I'm alive and I'm living, that's not wrapped up in any physical processes. The very concept of life existing and continuing came from the one who has life within himself creating in the very beginning. And the reason that's sustained, we see this in places like Colossians 1, is because the preeminent one, Jesus, in him all things consist. And so this very state of being, it obviously does not consist in the abundance of things possesses, one possesses because this man, he uh, had an abundance of possessions, took measures to keep them, and that life stopped. He stopped to exist, at least in this physical life. In his commentary, Linsky says, One striking reason for the futility of all covetousness is the simple fact that a man's zoe, the actual life in him, the life principle, not bios, the life one lives, but his actual life in him is not drawn from his earthly possessions. He will not have a bit more actual life when he has much or a bit less of that life when he has little. That's why the poor man and the rich man are on the same level, in the same boat. They're both drawing breath. They're both alive. You could argue that one's bios is not as good as another's bios, his activity of life and the things needed to maintain that life. It's not as great as this rich man, but not his zoe, and certainly not his abundance or lack thereof, transcendent life, which is another definition of zoe. And so not just the, the fact that I'm physically drawing breath and I physically exist, but the fact that I have a spiritual being. There's this greater transcendent life that we all possess. And so spiritual... Zoe really kind of turns out to take on a different meaning in the New Testament. That's a lot of what we see in the New Testament at times where there is a Greek word that has a, a pretty strong meaning in the regular language and then the Holy Spirit takes it to new heights. That's what we see with Zoe. Because Zoe is not just life as a principle, the fact that I, I am spiritually alive, but the very definition of that within Scripture involves an activity of life. 
And so in Galatians chapter 5, for example, and in verse 25, the Apostle Paul said, if we live, zoe, in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Spiritual life, vitality, a state of being spiritually is wrapped up in our fellowship with God. If I'm alive spiritually, it's because I'm involved in an activity of life with Christ. That's the ultimate context here. Your life does not consist in the abundance of things that you possess. It consists in being rich toward God, the activities of spiritual life. Notice there in Luke chapter 12 and in verse 20, he says, this night your soul will be required of you. What's he talking about there? You're no longer going to live in the flesh. The man's life is ending. But everything you've lived for is going to be translated into an accounting. And whether you've lived for the spiritual realities and for the spiritual home, or you've lived it up on this earth only for the transitory, that's going to be reckoned to you now. Your soul is being required of you. What do you have to show for it? And the answer was nothing. All he had to show was new bigger barns that were filled to the brim with his goods that would be left to someone he could not have any confidence in taken care of. And so the very context demonstrates that there are people who miss the whole point, even when they're thinking about someone teaching them. And so in verse 13, he said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And he said, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? He's saying, I'm not concerned with physical matters. You're missing the whole point. In verses 1 through 3, he talked about how we need to beware of hypocrisy. You claim to be a servant of God and you're living a different life. That's going to be exposed. He talks in verses 4 through 5 about fearing the one who can send the soul to hell rather than the one who can just destroy the body. That's a spiritual focus. In verses 8 through 9, he talks about how we need to be willing to confess Christ before men so that he can confess us before the Father. Because if we don't, then we're going to lose our fellowship with him. I'd rather lose my life, he's saying, than lose my life. And then he says in verse 10, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. And so spiritual considerations has led up to this point, and this man doesn't get it. And he says, Jesus, tell my brother to give me some money. And he says, don't you understand I have nothing to do with that? You're missing the whole point of this. And so he says, beware of covetousness. That's interesting. It's the Greek word pleonexia, and it means the state of desiring to have more than one's due. And so certainly in this context, it has to do with physical Riches, monetary considerations, financial considerations. But pleonexia is used throughout Scripture not just to denote the covetousness in the way we would think of it, like one who goes to gamble, one who wants more money when he's got an abundance of money and he doesn't want you to have your money. He wants to take it from you. It's, it certainly has to do with that. But the New American Standard Bible, I think, elaborates on it more. It says every form of greed. There's greed in the monetary sense. There's greed in the context of pride. People pay more attention to this man than they pay attention to me. And I want that attention. It can have to do with any other thing. It's going and having a desire for what is more than my due. So I want us to notice in Ephesians chapter 4 the word that is used. And Zoe is in Ephesians chapter 4 as well. And we can understand that this we shouldn't think of this just as a monetary sense. And so if you started to check out from the very beginning that I don't have a problem with materialism or or hoarding wealth, I don't need this, well, understand that covetousness has a lot more to do with life in general than just money. I just want us to notice in Ephesians 4 and verse 17. He says, This I say to you, therefore, and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. I want us to notice first, because of their ignorance and their worldliness and their association with sin, they were alienated from the life, zoe, of God. In other words, they had zoe in the sense that they existed and drew breath physically. They did not have spiritual vitality. 
They were dead spiritually. That's what he's saying. And they were dead spiritually because they weren't walking according to the will of God. And notice how that's described. They've given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. That's pleonexia. That's the word for covetousness in Luke chapter 12. And so the description here is that they were living and having a desire for more than what was their due, specifically in the frame of lewdness and uncleanness. But that could be said for anything. In Galatians 5, we read of the works of the flesh. We read of things like uncleanness and lewdness in Galatians 5. We read of things like hatred, contentions, and jealousies, and outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions. And then he goes on to say, and the like. So we could be guilty of this even in matters regarding how we think and how we feel and what we long for. In 2 Timothy 3, the Apostle Paul warned about the perilous times that would come. He talked about how men would be lovers of themselves. I think some people misunderstand the purpose of their life and their connection with God as they covet self-image that is respected in the minds of others. They make their life all about their self-esteem instead of focus on God. He talks about boasters and proud and haughty. They make their life about how good they are and how much better they are than others. He speaks about lovers of pleasure. They seek what feels good. That's what their life is all about. They're not worried about money. What feels good to them is something else, but it's the same problem. And they're working toward all of this in vain. Life does not consist in the abundance of wealth, of possessions, of friends, of compliments, of acknowledgments or achievements, of likes and comments for you younger social media focused people. Life does not consist in the abundance of relationships or fitting in. It doesn't exist in the form of any physical thing under the sun. Read Ecclesiastes. Everything in there could be considered in this discussion. So he had a vain perspective. He was too caught up in things that didn't really matter that would pass away very soon. And so it led to his vain emphasis in Luke chapter 12. He says, what am I going to do with all of my stuff? How am I going to have it for the future? My barns are too small. And he tears them down and builds bigger. I want us to notice, though, there in verse 16. He calls him a certain rich man. There's nothing wrong with being rich. But wouldn't you like to be described as something more than just a certain rich man? You see that? That's where it stopped for him. That's all he was. Then he says, what shall I do in verse 17? Again, it's, there's nothing wrong with planning and taking care of yourself and your family. But he is too focused on the physical. And he vainly thinks that in taking action, he can take care of his future. We know that that just didn't work. You know, it's interesting in these few verses, 17 through 19, there are 12 personal pronouns mentioned in those two short sentences in the original Greek. He talks about I and my and me. And what's ironic is that he was so concerned about himself that he actually neglects himself. In Mark, the eighth chapter in verse 36, Jesus said, what will it profit if a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul? He was so focused on himself that he neglected himself. One's life does not consist in anything regarding this temporary age. I think that's why John said this in 1 John 2 in verse 17 when he talked about all that is in the world and you don't love that if you want to love the Father. He says the world is passing away and the lust of it. Did you know that even the strongest desire you have for something physical in this life, the desire will even pass away? Not just the item, but the desire. You won't even have that desire. But he says he who does the will of God abides forever. It's interesting there. One of the things that is in the world is the pride of life. Bios. Having so much focus on my activities and what I have that sustains me. My business successes or my relationship successes or the kind of food I eat. You know, people have pride about that. You know, this this guy's going over into that restaurant. I'm in a five-star restaurant eating my meal. It's not what life is about. He had the, the vain perspective, which led to a vain emphasis, which led to a vain assurance. You remember there in verse 19, he says, I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. 
I see a shift from anxiety in verse 17. What shall I do to relief and assurance in verse 19? But I want to tell you that the assurance and relief was false and it only lasted as long as it took for him to say those words. Because then God said, fool, this night your soul is required of you. I want to tell you that for as much pleasure as people find in their sowing to the flesh, there will be a day of reaping. When I sow to the Spirit, it may not always be enjoyable because it involves standing up for my faith and being persecuted. It involves confronting one in sin and I may be rejected. The very whole process is difficult. Any number of things in sowing to the Spirit can be difficult. But Paul said in Galatians 6 and verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I think there's a good example of this in Matthew the 6th chapter. The Sermon on the Mount, you remember Jesus is speaking about their charitable deeds or their righteousnesses, if you have a different translation, the things that God would require of us. And how the Pharisees, what they did is that they sounded a trumpet so that people would look at them and they would have glory from men. And in Matthew 6 and verse 2, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. He's saying they got what they sought. They got glory from men and attention. They have their reward now. Now, you may not. You don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, vice versa. You do your charitable deed in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. When is that reward, though? They have their reward now. They sow to the flesh. The very sowing is their reward. I want the reaping. And that's what Jesus is saying. What's your focus? You want it now or do you want it later? This man wanted it now. And he got it for a very brief moment in Luke 12. And it was all taken away from him. I'm wanting to live for the reaping of everlasting life, aren't you? I want us to notice one more thing before we get to some more application about being rich toward God. That vain perspective that led to a vain emphasis and assurance also resulted in a vain recognition. He said in verse 20, God did, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? I'm reminded of a few chapters later with the account of the rich man of Lazarus and how he came into Abra- or a, a Hadean realm in torments and he was aware of all the vanity he lived for. He had total regret. There were obviously still some things he was not understanding, but he had total regret. He recognized his mistake, but it's too late. It was vain. That's what this parable is all about. Jesus is saying, don't let your thoughts be about your life consisting in the abundance of things he possesses, but rather be rich toward God. Don't be like this man in this parable. Don't have a vain recognition. Recognize early enough, like in Psalm 39 and verse 4, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths and my ages as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but a vapor. Surely every man walks about like a shadow. They busy themselves in vain and he heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. We need to recognize now before it's too late. That's what Jesus' parable is about. It's getting us to realize that no matter how distracting this life can be and how much true value you can find in some things like family, that's a blessing of God. But He's never intended us to be so caught up in it or any other blessing from God. Everything good and perfect comes from the Father of lights. John chapter, or James chapter 1 tells us. He's never intended any of those good things to distract us from Him. To distract us from the greater things He has to offer. If God can give me the family that I had growing up, and I was immeasurably blessed, what else could He give me? That's how our focus should be. I don't want to lose that perspective. I don't want to live a life in vain and emphasize things that are not even going to exist anymore. I don't want to fool myself into thinking I have exactly what I need in anything ephemeral. I want to be rich toward God. 
That requires a change in perspective. Notice in verse 31 of Luke chapter 12, like I said, he'd go on to talk about worrying and how we shouldn't. He says in Luke 12 and verse 31, Seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew records him saying, And his righteousness. He'd say in verse 33, Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Or no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For your, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. It requires a change in perspective and focus. Brethren, it's the perspective of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. It will be impossible for us to be rich toward God if all we're doing is living with our physical senses. I've got to live with something else. I've got to live by faith. Faith doesn't come from physical senses. Faith comes from God's revelation being poured into my heart as I read it and study it and am convicted in it and apply it to my life. Everything else, he says, for my children, I'm going to take care of it. He's not denying that there is a sense of bios and and the sense of life that is consisting in what is necessary to maintain it. I need food. I need water. I need clothing. I I need people in my life. Why do you think he, he designed the church the way that it is? But my focus needs to be on the treasures that are with him. The things that will last for eternity. So let me... Consider with you this morning a few as we near the end of our lesson, I understand. We need to be rich toward God, and that involves our seeking and valuing forgiveness, which results in a state of righteousness before God. It's interesting in First Timothy chapter 6, after he talked about the vanity of riches and how the desire to be rich pierces one through with many sorrows and temptations and struggles, he tells Timothy, but you, O man of God, flee these things, Pursue righteousness. He adds godliness and faith and love and patience and gentleness, but he's basically saying the same thing. Don't think your life consists in the abundance of things you possess, but seek to be rich toward God with righteousness and godliness and holiness and gentleness and all of these kinds of things. And I think that we'll be able to value it if we think of it in the way that Paul puts it in Romans chapter 4. It's interesting. He talks about the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. And that's a positive description of this. God puts righteousness to my account, but it's separate from anything that I've accomplished in the flesh. It's it's separate from works. And so then he goes on to describe it in the negative, which I think that it gives us more depth of appreciation for that forgiveness. It'll make us value it above the riches of this life and any other thing. So he quotes from David in Psalm 32 saying, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute iniquity. The blessedness of righteousness imputed is the blessedness of sin unimputed. That means I know what I've done. I know what terrible sins I've committed before God. I know what I'm deserving of and what I'm not deserving of. And I can have a greater appreciation for right standing before God when I realize it required him sending those sins away when he very well could have punished me for eternity. And so the blessing of righteousness first comes from the difficult recognition and humility of the curse of sin. This is why he began his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 with these Beatitudes saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They recognize their spiritual poverty, that they're bankrupt before God. And it leads to mourning. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. They're not just in recognition of it, but it's tearing them up inside. They shall be comforted. But that translates into blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. They are willing to yield their will submissively, entirely to God's control. But then he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. I know where I am. I know what it's done to me. I know what I have to do to get out of it. And God blesses me with that righteousness through that forgiveness. So David says in Psalm 32, as we read verses 1 and 2, he goes on to say, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. 
For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. That is such a powerful psalm. I think we've all experienced the weight of that. And we've kept from letting God take it off our shoulders. Understand the riches of His forgiveness. You go on to say, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. But that's not the end in itself, because forgiveness is to bring us into relationship with God. So don't think for a second you're being rich toward God just because you're baptized for the remission of your sins, because that was the start of a relationship restored. We need to value that. We need to long for it and seek it. When he's speaking about the fact that there are no idols in a world, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 6 says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for Him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. He's telling us that we exist for God. And so if you want to find fulfillment, that's where you're going to find fulfillment. You know, some people say, I was born to do X, Y, Z. I was born for this. And so they don't find fulfillment until they, they progress in that field, until they pursue that thing or that profession or whatever, whatever it is. The Holy Spirit's telling us we were born for God. And the way that we have that relationship with God is through whom we live, Jesus Christ. So notice in 1 John chapter 1, this whole discussion in 1 John is about us finding the joy in our relationship with God. So he, he echoes a lot of sentiments from John's gospel. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, and our eyes have seen, and we have looked upon, our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. By the way, that's Zoe. We want true, transcendent life. It's through that word who became flesh. He was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal Zoe, life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen we and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us. That's a relationship. That's a, a participation, a partnership. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. That's where true riches lie. He says, these things I write to you that your joy may be full. You be rich toward God. Develop that relationship. Be involved in the things that He has called us to. Philippians 3 and verse 10, to the extent that Paul left everything that he may know what is the fellowship of his sufferings for the rich is life. Thirdly, we need to seek transformation, which is the development of that relationship. In Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 13, the Apostle Paul, speaking of the edification of the church, shows the standard that we're working toward, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I believe that's what John chapter 6 is all about. I don't think we would necessarily usually think of John chapter 6 in regard to transformation. That's what he's talking about. When he's speaking about he's the bread of life, he talks about how one who eats of it will not die. And then he goes on and talks about how if you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, if you don't do that, you don't have any life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 54. He says in verse 58, This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, but he who eats this bread will live forever. It's a mistake to think that he's talking about partaking of the Lord's Supper. He's talking about consuming who he is. The way that he used his flesh and blood, the way he lived his life. He's saying, you consume that, and, and when I eat food, it becomes a part of me. Some is eliminated. Jesus said as much. What goes into the mouth does not defile a man, but is eliminated. But we understand that some of that sustenance comes into our very existence, our being. It gives us vitality and energy and strength. That's the concept he's drawing on here, is that when you eat Jesus, you consume Jesus, he becomes a part of you. But don't, don't misunderstand it in these physical things. That's what offended them and they went away. But I want us to notice what he goes on to say in verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit in our life. And so when he says, if you eat this bread, you will have life because it's the bread of life. He's saying, if you follow these words, you'll have life because they're the words of life. And this is what Peter understood. And Jesus said, y'all want to go away too? 
He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We need to be seeking and pursuing transformation. That's where the true riches lie. So where I don't know where you begin and end and Jesus begins and end because y'all are one. That's what the scripture requires of us. And that's where it offers the greatest fulfillment. And lastly, that's where that hope lies. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is speaking of that hope despite the suffering that we have to endure. And he says, we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Notice here, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What's he talking about there? I think that's the result of a life given to transformation. But he's talking about its consummation. So notice what he says in verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. It is God's will and promise and thus our hope to be transformed into the image of Christ while I live on earth so that in the end, when everything everyone else is working for, thinking their life consists in the abundance of things they possess, when all that's burned up and it passes away into eternal nothingness, I am truly seen as Christ is. I am truly transformed into His image. But that doesn't come unless I value and treasure that daily transformation as I live in this body. He talks about that as the inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you in 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 5. It's that which we will take on in our transformation and in our resurrection, which will allow us to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because flesh and blood can't. These are the riches that we must pursue. This is what life consists in. If I want spiritual vitality, spiritual life, it comes through these pursuits the things of God, and what He's offered to us by His good grace. appreciate your kind attention. Before we dismiss the classes, we'll be led in a word of closing prayer.